Great relationships don't just happen, they're designed. But how do you get the love you really want when you haven't had the models and examples you needed? We've learned the hard way that talking about stuff can change everything, but it doesn't come naturally, and that's normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the ups and downs of creating a custom-built love. We'll get personal and talk about what's worked for us, hear from Jolie about what the research can teach us about love, and answer listener questions. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. We're going to talk about relational individuation today. Awesome. What is that? (laughs) Okay. So I wanted to do an episode, a relatively short episode, because the concept is enormous, but it's not something that's necessarily going to grab you and say, wow, I really better know about relational individuation because, well, it's a phrase that I'm kicking around because it, it helps me tie two important facets of my life's work together. One is the concept of individuation. The, the whole notion that we are an, on an ever unfolding journey of becoming more and more ourselves, who we were meant to be, who we wish to be, that we're on a, we're in a process. This so is a, that's individuation, is that, that, that process, that Yeah, it's a developmental journey. trajectory. And some people imagine it like a, a hierarchy, like an ascension. Um, and, it, and that's how Jung took it. It was, it was really like an ascension. I think... I think of individuation much more like a spiral. Um, I start it, I start in the center as as my consciousness comes to being in mm-hmm. an embodied sense in this world, and then I walk a path ever deepening and growing, not so much higher, but actually just more. More. Okay. That's, that's that's the slant I take on it. And I tie that to relational. Well, for me, relationships are everything. Relationship to other, relationship to self, relationships between others that I witness. Mm -hmm. Um, But relationships have been my way of understanding things that at first felt totally opaque, totally, you know, impenetrable, things that I couldn't figure out at all. In relationship, I've been able to understand things that I never thought I could. Okay. So... Relationships are everything. We're on a path to be more ourselves. Yeah. Um, how do those two things so they, look, hook together? The reason I link these two things together are is that the way I trained, um, there's a lot of focus in Jungian psychology and actually in a lot of um, philosophical and meditative traditions. There's a, a certain... Um, isolatingness there's a there's a hermetic sort of closing off from the world and going inside focus on interiority and while i appreciate that there are a lot of people out there already writing about that and talking about it and it hasn't been for me the it hasn't been the path to deepening that i had hoped it would be instead the path to deepening and becoming more and more myself has has been more functional when I turn to relationship, to you, to mm-hmm. to feeling myself in relation to other, and to witnessing myself in relation to other, it allows me an ability to to self check. Sometimes you're inside, you know, the, everything that's going on in the interior is a bit of an echo chamber. Yeah. But what's going on on the outside? is also complicated because it's complicated by the reverberation that it gets. It's all, all that all that it gets back. So I don't think that these things are, are either or. I don't okay. really think that relationship is everything to the exclusion of the interiority of the focus on on being with one's self. But I I reject the claim that one should be prioritized over the other. And I reject the claim that relational individuation isn't just as valuable as a hermetic individuation. Okay. So what do you want to tell us about relational individuation today? What do you want us to know? Okay. So so first off, not everybody's going to care about this. 
Um, Jung certainly had problems. You know, C.G. Jung is a man of his time. Um, upper echelons of Swiss psychology um, society in the early 20th century, uh, married money, all the, <laughs> all of the in indoctrination that that comes with and all of the um, white supremacy and the, and the focus on, on money and capitalism, all of that. So I don't want to say that we just take, pick up all his stuff and say, yay, it's all awesome. It's not that at all. But the way that he talked about individuation was to say, not everybody wants to do this. Some people feel very well held by the cultural container that they find themselves in. So okay. an example of that would be someone who grew up in the Catholic Church, feels very well um, held there, feels a sense of not just belonging, but meaning. And it works for them. It works. And they feel good about that. That person is is welcome to stay there. Individuation was Jung's way of saying, if you don't fit in your in that container that you find yourself in. And this doesn't mean you have to throw that container away. You may stay in that container, but also go on to do your own work, to find your own meaning and to question the philosophy within you that you are finding yourself operating in. It's not, so it's not an either or, but being really well held in the container, the cultural container that you're in, might mean that you never find yourself seeking this way. You might right. never if you're, face that like question of so what, what is. What drives you to individuate? Massive discomfort. Okay. So, <laughs> and well, that's kind of what I thought you were going to say, because if you're comfortable in your container, you might not look for anything more. Yeah. So, but if you're not comfortable, right. then you might. So I looked for more right right away. I was I was that kid who was questioning everybody mm -hmm. constantly, questioning my pastor, questioning my parents, questioning my grandparents, questioning my teachers. And when I say questioning, I don't mean just asking them questions. I mean completely absolutely balking and and fighting with questions their right to be authority over me. Uh -huh. Okay. Um I, I wanted an explanation. I I remember telling someone when I was maybe seven years old that respect was earned and they were going to have to prove it to me. They were like 50 years <laughs> old and I was in a very regular conservative church. I don't know what I thought I was going to get away with. That's, uh, that's a bold statement from a seven-year-old. And the discomfort I have, just not never having felt like I fit, meant that I was always seeking, always looking. And I think most people who would be listening to a show like ours mm -hmm. have that, that, that tone of seeker, seekerness, whether they feel well held in their religion and culture and, and communities or not. I think that there's a, a, a seeker attitude, a seeker archetype awake in them. Um, otherwise, why would you be listening to me prattle on? <laughs> but your reason for individuating might also just be that um, nothing seems to be working. Uh, a dark night of the soul is a very common way in to indi individuation. Um, mm -hmm. Often at the age of 37. I don't know why, but I see so many people who begin this around is that 37. When it, dark night of the soul, is that when things start to not look right or not work right? or it's It looks different for everyone, but we see people have like start to feel like their life doesn't fit start describing a shell that's too tight or nothing makes any sense or they're questioning things that they thought were rock solid just a year or two ago they're questioning everything uh, questioning meaning in their life questioning what they're doing with their life um, questioning right so jung said that the first half of life was when you were building your, your ego, your ability to be in the world and function as an adult. So I don't take ego to be necessarily bad. I know a lot of people talk about ego in a very negative way. I don't think of ego as bad um, or even just protective. I think of it as a very functional state of consciousness that serves a purpose and continues to serve a purpose. But at some point, we become aware of more, more of us. So like, um, 
well, I have a household full of teenagers, they're developing their strength of ego. So they have to make one-sided statements. And they, 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 they take these stances that are so, they're so certain about the kind of certain you certainty you can only feel when you're not in this questioning and and in this what the hell does everything mean and yeah like but you but in order to come at your life in midlife in order to to start questioning everything you believe in first you have to believe in some stuff you have to build oh. that yeah sure right? okay if you're just if you're just wandering around through life um Really never taking anything in, not taking any stance, not having any, um, not having any ambition to, to understand yeah. something, right? Okay. And not taking the risk of being wrong by, by standing in your, in your, tr- in your belief, in your truth, then yeah, what would there be to question, what you question? at midlife? What, what questions are there to ask? I guess you might question yeah, at okay. that point, meaninglessness, but, but you actually, might never get there too. Yeah. Um, What about you? Why do you, why are you on this path? So you said um, discomfort. And I think for me, it came out as dissatisfaction. Mm. I felt like I could do better, do more, do, I I could, I guess it's a kind of discomfort feeling the difference between who I was and who I thought I could be. Well, so imagination then. Mm -hmm. Another Mm -hmm. reason why people find themselves needing to turn to a word like individuation is that their imagination starts to stretch and create like that, the reality, like, Oh, there's more possible, even if they can't quite understand what that more is, um, or they're exposed to ideas or thoughts, or they have a numinous experience for me, a numinous experience, a numinous experience is a, a sacred or holy experience. But I mean this in a very, a religious way. I mean, this is a such a powerful experience that it, it really defies fitting into the mundane world. Okay. I had one on a sticky bar floor. Uh, I, not on the floor. Luckily, I was just dancing. But the, the floor the was floor. very sticky. Was sticky. A numinous moment can be an awakening, but so can um, a profound fall into depression. Mm-hmm. Or um, the loss of someone that is yeah. followed by waves of grief. I think in my my circumstance, I think it really started when my mother died. My my father had already died. My mother died, and now it was just me. There was no 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 previous generation anymore. And I, I think that start. It didn't. Not yeah. a lot happened, but I think it started the ball rolling. And so, when I think about individuation. I, I feel a great sense of comfort knowing that other people have experienced this sort of a, a need to grow past what their life appears to be able to contain right mm-hmm. now. Um, I've read numerous biographies and, and excerpts and stories of people who have faced this dark night of the soul or transformative moment or numinous experience followed by years of growing and challenging themselves. And really from this point on, it never stops. From from that point when you begin that that part of your life, I mean, you'd have to you would have to actively stop it. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, that's my experience not, of it. Because here's the thing, it's not going to finish. Yeah. <laughs> there is no individuated. If somebody tells you that they've individuated, uh, they're missing the point. They they've missed the point. Um it is an ongoing experience that one could hope, um, we could hope it would be fast, I suppose, but that's not the point either. That's not the point. It's a way of It's a new way of being. being. Yeah. yeah. And this is why, for me, when I tied it to the relational, um, when, I, when I realized that walking a path with my, with a partner who had also decided to be walking his own individuation path, mm-hmm. um, the, something really like doubled up. There was like there was a a a multiplication actually, yeah. not just an addition, a multiplication of oh, we're going to commit individually to growth on a trajectory we can't possibly predict, 
And we're going to do that with a commitment between each other. Our primary vow in our marriage ceremony was to each other's growth. Growth, yeah. Which means that at some point, or at multiple points, we might not be the right person to stand next to each other. Right. Um, you know, we might need to do things on our own. And it happened actually right away. We made those vows. And a month later, you were diagnosed <laughs> with multiple scler sclerosis and yep. needed to start, tra you know, traveling a road of, oh, mortality, but also, you know, like, because all sicknesses bring mortality Absolutely, to the surface, yeah. even though that one doesn't have yeah, but um, but also just oh, your body, the place you feel more most comfortable, was no longer going to be exactly what you thought. Yeah, and then not a month after that, I applied to grad school, and we closed our business, and every we like yep. everything got, and it was the idea that we could be committed to growth and know that we might not be able to to be at each other's side all the time might not be able to we could even be support but we couldn't necessarily predict whether we were gonna whether we were gonna make it from a monogamous perspective a monogamous whether perspective. we were going to whatever it stay might be. the course of a particular imagination of marriage yep. and i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing no because it, it's it's been that that simultaneous tied together and freedom that has left me feeling how I have to choose you every day. Yeah. Have to. Get to. I get to choose you. You know, every day I have a I have a thousand opportunities to choose elsewise, to choose another direction. And I choose you and you become one of my primary mirrors for who I am in the world. Mm -hmm. And I have to take that very seriously. You're a mirror. You aren't a mirror. But I, being human, often see myself reflected back to me. Right. As as if it were you, except... Yeah, except it's not. <laughs> it's my projections. It's my stuff. And allowing myself to be with you like that. I'm happy. I'm content to live uh, my life that way. Uh, me too. I, I agree with you about the, the choosing. There's something really energizing to me and empowering to be aware of the fact that it's a choice it's always a choice i choose you and knowing you choose me knowing that you're in the same spot and that you're here because you're choosing me yeah makes me feel well appreciated i mean at a, in a in a very um selfish way i feel good about the fact that you choose me and so in order to know that, in order to feel good that way, yeah. you have to, to not grasp too tightly. Yes. Because if I feel compelled, if I feel like I have to stay, yeah. then you can't really know that I'm choosing to stay. And I found that feeling, I, I find that feeling when it comes up really unsatisfying. I, I don't like it. Well, I so. mean, we had to do some specific work around this to yeah. figure out how we were going to make it real that we could be separate. And practice being distinct people because it, it takes practice. I like you a lot. So it takes practice for me to maintain my sense of self mm -hmm. and to not accidentally enmesh with you. But sometimes sometimes it's the smallest moment when I realize I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. Um, last night I was lying in bed and you had curled up around me in a particular way. And I thought, chances are it won't always feel just like this. Like mm. the, one of us will be gone or something will happen or whatever. And being able to really feel how I, I chose, the choices I make made it so that I could feel the intense pleasure of simply being near you in that moment. <sighs> yeah. And I have to let you be other. It like it opened the space yeah. between the two of us. In that moment, I could feel the space open, feel the separateness. Even though we were pressed right against each other, I could feel the separateness of, oh, you are other. Yeah. Even while we are all one, like it, it, in a really profound way, we're we're all the same stuff. It's this is why I like this kind of messy, confusing relational work. 
because in it are these moments that are just really sacred. That's my experience of the way our individual growth paths combine into the relationship that we have. It's yeah, um, it, it, yeah multiply is exactly the right word. It's, so the other question that I get frequently and I want to cover before we wrap this episode up is what if my partner is totally not into this? Mm. And I know you've had some some chats with people about this too, friends that you have and people you've met who are like, yeah, my partner isn't interested in um, relational work particularly. Or, and I have I run into it all the time where I, I meet somebody who's like, I really want to do this work and I want my partner to be on the same page because if they're not, won't I get too far away from them? Oh, yeah, I see. And I think that right in there, you've actually... This, that sentence, won't I get too far away from them, is key. Because if you, if you think of that, the image of that, um, the imagination that we can stay right with someone, is in, it's, a, it's a fiction. It's a fiction. We're having unique experiences every day. And e even if we were to completely enmesh, we still have individual consciousness individual history and we have the what is pulling us forward yeah. whatever that might be and so when i when someone asks me well what if my partner doesn't want to do this and won't i get too far away from them i i say well what if they're on their path and we have no idea where they're going we we can't tell you know i can't tell where your partner's going but what if they are an anchor point for you as you journey and you travel mm -hmm. that spiral, whether they are moving on their own spiral or not, what if you simply spiral around them on your unique dance and simply allow them to be them? So rather than force them to come on your journey, which they can't come on anyways, let them be them. And I would say, and invite them into the work sometimes, you know, when, yeah. when that makes sense, invite them into the work for themselves, create perhaps some opportunities for that. Um, I've done that for you along the way. There were yep. times when I was, I had an inkling that something that I was doing might have value for you as well. Um, and so I would invite you into that process. And then sometimes when I thought, I see this thing and you don't look out as much as I do. Yep. So I would put this opportunity in front of you and say, I think this might be of value to you. And I think it's normal. It, it's I am I am the leadership in many ways in our household. Mm -hmm. I tend I and certainly in this psychological soul, soulful way, I tend to bring ideas to you and introduce them. And that doesn't make me better than you, but on my path that makes sense, and I invite you into it. And my my role then is to not take it personally if you choose not to pick those up. It's not about me. It's about you. Yeah. They're just offerings, and it's not a—it's not an offering. It's not a gift. If I'm wrapped up in your response to it, yeah, and I the, I like that as an as an approach to take as, okay, so I'm on this this, I've I've decided I'm going to be on this journey toward myself, and my partner isn't really into it, but the idea that I can still offer, still yeah. offer opportunities, uh, of whatever. I mean, and it's not like it's a clear delineation between I'm currently doing a growth oriented <laughs> thing and I'm not. It's more that, Hey, this is, this is cool. I Look mean, at this. Isn't this neat to talk about, think watched, about whatever. And we've watched movies that were part of our growth work. Yeah. We've gone on walks that were like yeah. all of a sudden became part of the work. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I cleaned a chicken coop once and it was definitely a whole piece of my mm -hmm. own work. Like that, that needed to happen. That was a, a full day's manual labor. That was absolutely part of my work. There are a million ways for this to yeah. go. There are millions and millions and millions and billions of ways. An infinity of ways. But I would worry less about what your partner's doing and simply come back to, you're here on your journey and inviting each other into relation yeah. can be fun, but it doesn't have to be the same for it to be yes. appropriate for and, each individual and there's the thing it's relational individuation it's both 
and the both and is where a lot of good stuff happens so okay so i think there. that says enough about I think that that's, for yeah. this time now at least when i say that phrase people will know what i'm talking about but yeah. i'm going to be answering more questions about this in I've, the future and i have one last thing to say that it is relational individuation that allows us to do this podcast definitely like the way the, the what what you hear and and how we are able to be present in my experience well for me it's absolutely because of how i approach this from an individuation point of view being so responsible you, you know, for myself yeah. yep and honoring your responsibility for yourself Pretty very cool. satisfying <laughs> okay okay till next time keep talking to each other Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode. I've got one more thing I'd like to share with you, and that you're just going to need to hop over to the website listentojolie.com. There you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Go get those guides. They're great. They're easy to implement conversations that will help you take action in creating the love you really want. It's my mission to make absolutely everything talk aboutable. She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my, my lovers, my friends, my family, and you um, on a podcast. Out loud relationship work really can change everything. That really is a wonder. One of my favorite things in the whole world. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way that you'd hoped in your relationships, I want you to remember that relationships can be messy and that's good news. <laughs>